on here? Can you hear me now? As they say, hey, there it is. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Living Way Church. I am so glad you are with us here and that you are joining us online. It's so glad, so glad to have you here. Go ahead and hit the share button so that every, every uh, Facebook friend of yours also is being exposed to Jesus this morning. Woohoo! Would you stand with me as we get ready to worship Jesus this morning? I'm really, really excited. Exposed. Yeah, that was not the best term, huh? My wife's back here making fun of me for saying exposed. It's just the word that we think of in COVID land. I'm sorry. Ah. Oh. Man, we already started off on a weird foot. Uh, I am looking forward to today to worship Jesus with you. I'm looking forward to sharing from the scriptures with you. And I want to begin with Psalm 112. We like to read a psalm to prepare our hearts to worship Jesus. Psalm 112 says, Praise the Lord! Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. He is distributed freely. He is given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desires of the wicked will perish. This Psalm 112 describing the righteous man is ultimately truly describing Jesus. That he is our righteousness, and he gives that righteousness to us by grace through faith. And so we also will, like Christ, never be moved if we have the righteousness of Christ upon us in our hearts. And that's what, the righteousness that we're going to praise him for this morning. We're going to worship him because he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. So I'm excited to worship Jesus this morning. We have our children in service. They're going to be in here for worship before being dismissed afterwards to the children's service. It's going to be a wonderful Sunday morning. Let's praise him. Praise be your weapon that silences the end. all anxiety let it arise let praise arise we sing your name in the dark and it changes everything we sing with all we are and we claim your victory let it arise Breakthroughs on our side, forever lift him high. With all creation, cry, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you. Oh, let faith be a song that overcomes the raging sea. Let faith be the song that calms the storm inside. Let it arise, let faith arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise. This is what freedom feels 
feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise we'll see you break down every wall we'll watch the giants fall fear cannot survive when we praise you the god of breakthroughs on our side forever lift him high with all creation cry god we praise you
have torn apart the sea. You have led me through the deep. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're the God who fights for me. Lord of every victory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have torn apart the sea. You have led me through the deep. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You stepped into my Egypt and you took me by.
John 8, 31, to the Jews who believed, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And they answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave doesn't remain in the house forever. The Son remains forever. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because the word finds no place in you. I speak of what I've seen with my father, and you do what you've heard from your father. Jesus draws the contrast between those that believe in him and have the truth and those who don't believe in him and are slaves to sin. It's very black and white, one way or the other. You're either a slave or a son. You either either belong to Satan or you belong to Jesus. And our desire is that we all walk in the freedom that is given to us through Jesus Christ. When you believe, that Jesus died for you, that Jesus rose from the dead, then all of the inheritance that belongs to the Son of God is promised to you because of faith, because of the work he's done. This is the gospel that we stake our lives upon. It's all about Jesus, the Son of God, who's given his life for us. So right now, you can be free. You can walk in the freedom It's simple. Just believe in Jesus. Lord, right now we humble our, we acknowledge you are God. We thank you for living and dying for us. We thank you that you rose from the dead and have guaranteed us everlasting life. So Lord, let the freedom of the salvation that we have rest upon our hearts right now in your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you for standing together in worship and prayer. You may be seated. And I think my microphone is cutting out, and so I may need to switch microphones. Is that the best idea right now? Lady, you, give me your microphone. We're going to go that route. All right. Thank you, worship team. Really awesome. Jacob, good job leading up there. Love it. Ah, So many good things. Our our youth had a little one-day worship camp experience last, a a week ago yesterday up at Pondo, and it was like, there was like this little tiny speckle of snow on the ground, enough for them to like pick up and coat in mud and then throw at each other. And today, of course, up there, it's covered in snow. That's just the way it goes one week later. Uh... But we're so grateful for our youth, and they're, they're awesome. They love Jesus. They love to worship. They love to serve. We have, like, 100% youth participation in serving in different capacities in the church. So, so thankful for that. Uh, before we dismiss our kids to our uh, kids' ministry service, I do want to tell you about, I'm so excited for next weekend. Next weekend, starting Saturday night, this Saturday night, 6 p.m., we're having our mission weekend. So Saturday night at 6, and then Sunday, our regular 10 a.m. service. These are our big mission weekend service. Now, what we're doing Saturday night is very different. We have 18 different missionaries that we support. uh, And what we're going to do on Saturday night is we've got a bunch of videos from rather than inviting them all in from all over the world, which we really can't do, them to send us videos to tell us about what God has done in their ministry over the past year of 2020. Because we go, oh man, 2020 was so hard. How did missionaries 
deal with it? What did they do? And they have some really, really cool stories to share with us. And so we're going to hear from them. Uh, we're going to pray for them. And it's going to be a real blessing. So I invite you to come out next Saturday night. Tune in. If you want to hear what has gone on in the lives of our missionaries this past year, it's really great. So Saturday night, 6 p.m., it will be live. Um, and you won't be able to, we're, we're, I'm not sure how all the technical stuff is going to work out, but it, it's not the same if you're only watching it. But we, we're glad that you can watch it live. So uh, Saturday night, 6 p.m., and then next Sunday, 10 a.m., it's our mission weekend. We want you to be a part of it. Our theme is Speak of the Glory, and we're going to talk about the glory of God in our lives. So it's going to be great. I'm looking forward to it. Before we receive our offering, uh, and by the way, our offering, thank you for being faithful in giving tithes, offerings, missionary faith commitments, giving online, lwcpoway.com slash give. Um, and if you are wanting to give in person, there's an offering envelope, and you can drop it in the offering envelope box in the foyer area. Our missionary prayer focus is actually a, a local church prayer focus. This week, we are praying for Zach and Laura Elliott and Fusion Christian Church. Temecula. Next week, next Sunday, is their church anniversary, and I, I'm not exactly sure how many years, so I apologize. Uh, at Fusion Christian Church in Temecula, and so we're really grateful for our partnership, relationship with them. God's doing amazing things at Fusion Christian Church, so we're going to pray for them and for our offering here before we dismiss our children. Thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness in providing for your church around the world. And in the families that are being impacted by the ministry of Fusion Christian Church. And so we pray this blessing upon them. We thank you that you provide for us and that we're able to give uh, out of the abundance that you provide in us. Uh, Lord, I pray this morning that as we give our offerings, as we commit our, uh, our income, our revenues, we commit them to you. Lord, you bring back an incredible blessing on all those who faithfully serve you. We pray a blessing on this offering and upon our Laura. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. At this time, our children are dismissed to the children's ministry service. Thank you so much for our children's ministry workers. You guys are doing a fantastic job. Um, uh, Jeff and Krista Hudgens, amazing, doing an amazing job with the children on Sunday mornings, with the youth on Saturday nights. So great. Such wonderful servants. We're so thankful. All right, I'm going to take a little bit of awkward kind of moving things around here. You know, when we switched and did all this online and we we, we, had, we used to have a bigger pulpit. We still have a bigger pulpit, but I have to use this smaller pulpit, and I haven't yet adjusted how I use paper on my smaller pulpit. I need, maybe I need a smaller Bible, or maybe I should go like the really cool pastors and just do the iPad stuff, the iPad preaching. That's what I should do instead of real paper, but I'm not there yet. I've still got that old school in me, all right? Paper, real Bible. Hey, everybody, and hi, everyone online. I'm really excited for this sermon today. Oh, oh, hold on. I was going to just like greet everybody in a generic way, but I have, I see up there, Steve, Grandpa, congratulations to the Cosentinos celebrating a new, they're, they're first. Now you are officially, are you a grandpa? What are you called? Papa. All right. Papa Steve up there. And what is your grandson's name? Everett. Well, we're praising God. So grateful for the Cosentinos, for Christy having a baby boy, Everett, even though they live in Tennessee. Oh, poor, poor Everett. But at least he's a Padres fan. I saw that, so I'm excited for that. All right. So good things going on in the life of the church. Well, today I'm going to conclude a three-part series that we've been doing called Time for Transformation. Time for Transformation. Talking about, and just by uh, way of background, if you missed the first two sermon series, it's all based on this verse, Romans 12, 1 and 2. It says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. 
do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. I told you it just after we came out of the worship time, there's a, there's a black and a white, there's a contrast there is, there is slaves and there is sons. And all of us at one time were slaves to sin. But through Christ, we can become sons of God. This is true of every person that lives. Slaves, from slaves to sons. That's what we want to see. It's the same idea that's at work here. There is a transformation that takes place. And if you are not being transformed, then you are being conformed into the ways of this world. And the world... And when I say the world, you could even put in the word Satan or the devil instead of the world. There is a plan that is taking place. And the world is constantly teaching us, threatening us, and tempting us to get with the plan. Get with our agenda. And again, the plan is confusion, chaos, disorder. We don't want to go that way. We see it taking place all the time. We're, we're battling that all the time, every day in our lives. Are we going to conform into the ways of the world, or are we going to be transformed into the ways of Christ, into Christ-likeness? And I've told you the last two weeks, and I will emphasize it again today, the way that we are transformed is by beholding the glory of Jesus Christ. So my goal these past three weeks has been to encourage you to behold better. Behold better better. I want us to behold Jesus. As we behold him, we become like him. As we look at him, we see him, and it changes the way that we act. It changes the way that we think. While the world is teaching us how to operate according to the world's plans, we need daily habits of reading the word of God so that our minds are being renewed. So that was week one. Read the Bible and pray every single day. I recommend, just by, by, by way of, you know, just simple, uh, here's a good habit for you. Before you look at anything on your phone, read the Bible. Read the Bible. It works. It's crazy. Because there's a compulsion that we have to read our phones or look at our phones or, oh, what, what, or read the news or turn on the TV, all those things. Before you do any of that, look to the Word and let the Word teach us. That's really important in the transformation. We're going to behold Jesus. We have to see him. And then we talked last week about weekly routines that confront the world's threats. The idea is, again, that there are threats against us. There's intimidation. And if we don't have the surrounding of the saints, if you don't have the preached gospel to you every single week, over and over and over and over and over, we're going to forget the good news and focus on the bad news. And if we focus on the bad news... Threat, intimidation, fear. We don't want that. We're no longer a slave to fear. We just sang it. So we weekly gather to worship and to hear the gospel. So those are the two the daily and weekly habits and routines that we need to put into our lives in order to help us in our transformation, to behold Jesus better. But today, I'm going to talk to you about what I call special occasions to combat. Special occasions to combat the world's temptations. What I mean by that is, so the, the first one is, is a daily tip, right? You read the Bible every single day. And the, the second one is a weekly one. You gather for worship weekly. Those are pretty simple. But special occasions don't necessarily follow the same cycle. They aren't, they aren't daily. They aren't weekly. But they are consistent yet sporadic. And, and, and what happens with these kind of consistent but sporadic but also important reminders is they set up our soul to combat temptation. And temptation, probably more so than threat and even teaching, is the, one of the hardest parts for us to, to, to fall victim to conformation rather than transformation. T uh, temptation is the the chief tool of Satan. If you remember, if you remember the Garden of Eden, Satan didn't come necessarily with a teaching, and he didn't necessarily come with a threat to Adam and Eve. He came with a temptation. With Jesus, when he goes into the wilderness and, and follows the, sort of the pattern of Adam, he doesn't get taught 
by Satan or necessarily threatened by Satan. He is tempted by Satan. Temptation is the chief tool of Satan, and his most effective temptations always involve God's good gifts. You remember again Satan trying to tempt Jesus in the wilderness that he used the word of God in his temptations. See, this is, uh, Satan is not stupid, by the way. I, I th- some of you might think he is. I, I mean, no, he's clever. And so Satan comes along, and instead of telling us what sin is really going to do for us, he lies. He lies. Nobody is going to give in to temptation if we know the truth of the temptation, right? We know if, if Satan were to come to the to try and tempt someone to commit adultery. Do you think Satan's going to come along and say, hey, if you commit adultery, think of all of the shame that's going to bring on your spouse. Think of how, how all of your family is going to be embarrassed by your behavior. Think of uh, the fact that you might lose your job because of the, the, the abuse that you do. Think of all of the, 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 the way your children are going to be so hurt and heartbroken. Don't you think that's the best thing that you could do? That's not how temptation works. It doesn't lay out the facts of all of the negative things that are going to happen. Not at all. It's a lie. It's a lie. And it comes and it feeds on good gifts. It's like, oh, if you commit adultery, that's because your heart really needs that relationship. That's where it's missing. If you have that, that person, that's what's really, your, your spouse, they're not doing the, the, a good enough job. They don't really love you. They're, they're busy. They're ignoring you. They're, they don't care. But that person, oh, yeah, that's the lie. You see, like, plain and simple, it's a lie. We know it's a lie, but we fall for it. We fall for it just because, not because we hear the, the negatives, but because we hear the good gifts. That's, that's how it works, right? And Satan is constantly tempting us to pursue gifts rather than the giver. Because the truth of the matter is, if we have our priorities not set simply on the gifts, but rather on where are those gifts coming from and why does the giver of those gifts give us good gifts, if we have in mind Jesus, the creator of all good things, who gives us good things, more than we have on mind those good things, we'll be able to learn to resist so all these things that tempt us, all these good things, food, security, finances, money, relationships, they're all good things in the pro- appropriate context of gifts from the good giver. And when we recognize that, it helps us to resist temptation. So how do we do that? Well, all those things are not the end of themselves, but they're representative of the greater thing, the good gift giver. Good gift giver. That's a fun one. Uh, And how does he bless us these gifts? He gives us feasts to remember these things. So what I want to encourage you today is to equip you to resist temptation by looking ahead to the feast. That might sound a little obscure at the beginning here, but as I explain it and show you with scriptures, this is really, really common principle. And in fact, if I use, by way of example, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, right? Resist temptation by looking ahead to the feast. The day before Thanksgiving is probably a day that you're a little bit better in not eating junk food. You're like, hmm, you know, tomorrow is the best meal of the entire year. Maybe I can do without those flaming hot Cheetos today. Maybe, right? It's just, the, 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 now on an average ordinary Wednesday, yeah, flaming hot Cheetos, yeah, it's Wednesday. But on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, you can resist. Why is that? Because you see the something greater that is in store. It's right there on the horizon. Actually, I'll, t- I'll tell you an even more l- truthful example. Even though it's going to have me sleeping alone tonight. This happened three days ago. I bought my wife a box of C's chocolate candies, her absolute favorites. 
they're called Bordeaux something. I don't know. Bordeaux. Yeah. Have you, any of you had these Bordeaux from Seas Candy? Because I love my wife, I bought her a pound of these. And I left them there in the pantry. And they were there. And she opened up uh, the pantry. And said, oh, yay. So happy. The next day, we're driving down Pomerado Road. And we're driving past a 7-Eleven. And she says, man, I bet there's a lot of really great candy in there. I, I was like, what? You have a pound of the greatest candy in the world. And we're going home. We're going there right now. And you're thinking about them? You're thinking about the, the Sour Patch Kids? How insulting. How dare you? Why are you thinking about, why are you being tempted by those lesser gods when the good stuff is at home? And ashamed, she acknowledged and repented. And it was, it was, <laughs> it worked out. And then, you know, she went home. She's like, okay, you're right, you're right. She got home and, you know, had her good chocolates. But I was like, oh, this is a great sermon illustration. This poor lady doesn't know that she just walked into. And now, like I said, I'm sleeping alone tonight. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Just drive past that 7-Eleven. I speak as to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? So we see Paul's writing to the Corinthians. He says the way out of temptation is look ahead to the feast, or rather look back to the feast that Jesus endured. So you remember that Jesus, Jesus, when, when he went to the cross, think about it, he's the the on the eve of the crucifixion, he says, I long to join, to have this feast with you, my disciples. I long to remember the Passover feast, to remember that Jesus, or that God, delivered his people through the Red Sea. He delivered them with the blood of the Passover lamb over their doorpost. He delivered them by his great power and his outstretched arms. And we remember his deliverance every year at the Passover. And then Jesus says, I'm going to take all of that and fulfill it to an even greater degree. And I'm going to give you this communion meal. I'm going to redefine it. So it's not just about a lamb that was slain, but it's about the lamb of God who takes upon himself the sins of the world. Jesus makes the feast all about him all about him. Feast of Jesus, by focusing on what he has done, and by receiving that feast together, we are able, as Paul says, to have a way out from temptation. How can we resist temptation? Look at the feast. When Jesus went on the cross, he, he, he was able to endure the cross by thinking of the joy of the feast. This is what it says in Hebrews 12 too. Look to Jesus, that's us, look to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. What's that mean? Jesus was able to go through the cross because on the cross he saw not the present temptation, not the present pain, but the greater glory, the greater glory of being seated at the right hand of the Father. He saw the joy that was before him. He saw that in that joy, in that victory, he would not be alone, but that you would be with him. Jesus saw you, and he saw me, and he saw all the nations gathered and surrounding the throne of God and enjoying the presence of the glory of God for all eternity and was able to resist the temptation that was being offered to him. Remember on the cross, he's on the cross, and they're saying, if you really are the Son of God, command angels to come and take you down. Defend yourself. He endured the temptation. He resisted the temptation for the joy that was to come. And so it is for us. 
we can resist temptation by thinking about feasts. I love feasts. I love holidays. I love Thanksgiving. I love Christmas. I love Easter. I love all of those. Uh, you know what else I love? I love weddings. Gosh, I really love weddings. My, my nephew, Evan, I just found out, well, no, I knew this, but I didn't actually do the math. He's getting married here. Uh, we were praying for Fusion Christian Church. He's going to get married in April, like two days before Easter. And I was like, how are we supposed to make that happen? I don't know. It's going to be really fun, though. Wedding and Easter and all, all that stuff. It's going to be a blast. I love it. And that's what, but there's special occasions. They're not always at the same day, the same time. They're not every week. They're not every day. So you look forward to those things. And that way you're, you're able to remind yourself. Because temptation, by the way, is not a daily thing. The same temptation. It's sporadic. It's well, one day you're tempted like this. One day you're tempted like that. It's, oh, this, this, this. Same with goes. We look forward to the feast. Look forward to what's ahead. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about feasting this morning. And hopefully you get you all excited about feasting so that when the next feast that is a part of your life, whether it's a birthday or whether it's the mission weekend next week, whatever it may be, you are excited about it. By the way, for you guys that are watching online, because you can do this. I, I don't want to have the interaction here. It's a little weird. Type in, what's your favorite holiday? What's your favorite feast? What do you enjoy? Maybe it's a birthday. Maybe it's Valentine's Day. I don't know. Type it in. I want to know. So I'll, I'll go back afterwards and check those out. All right. So here's the two essential ingredients that we have for a feast. Ready? Just two. Giving and enjoying. Giving and enjoying. Think about it. Can you have a feast without those two things? It's impossible. There has to be giving, contributing, serving, set up, all those things. Set up, clean up, Martha. And there has to be enjoying, participating, laughing, talking, Mary, engages. Mar both Martha and Mary hold its essential elements to feasting. So I want to talk to you guys about giving and feast and giving and enjoying this morning. And, 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 and as I do that, I'm going to do a little bit of practical stuff, a little more than I would usually, uh, by also to tell us about next week. So let me tell you for just a minute about how, how Living Way Church operates based on giving. The whole church, everything we do here. All of the building, all of the finances, all of it is through giving. We don't have any kind of special revenue streams other than this. You give. And there's essentially three ways that we have giving here at Living Way Church. There's what we call tithes, offerings, and faith commitments. And I'm going to break those down for you real quick. For you who are, maybe you've been here for 40 years or maybe you're, it's your first time here. What are you talking about? What are these words mean? Tithes, offerings, faith commitments. I don't talk about them, but once a year. So here it is. Tithes. Tithing is a biblical principle which refers to the top 10% of your income that is given back to God. Now, some people would argue, well, that's an Old Testament thing. It was only Abraham. Others would say, well, Jesus confirmed it. Uh, others would say, well, um, it's great, but it doesn't go far enough. So either way. But there's a very clear biblical precedent set under Abraham and then also for the people of Israel to tithe. And that word tithe literally means 10%. That 10% of income given back to the kingdom of God. So that was how it was operated. Now, what's interesting, though, is it doesn't just go tithes. In the, if, if we read the Old Testament, it's not just tithes, but there's also offerings. And the offerings were in particular, aimed during the feasts. So there was seven feasts, and with each of those feasts, God said, okay, you have your regular, ordinary tithe, but you also, on top of that, are supposed to bring more gifts during the feast time. And if you add all of those, those feasts, uh, the, the tithes and the offerings together, instead of it just being 10%, the actual income was closer to 23%. Now, we don't, I don't tell you nearly enough that you need to be giving 23% of your income if you really want to abide by the Old Testament principles. But I'll tell you that this morning. So good luck. All right, get on there. I, you're like, oh, man, you're almost as bad as California. Not quite, though. Not quite. Just kidding. Uh, so, but either way, 
tithes, offerings, whether you think it's a 10% or it's 23%, it's 17%, it's 5%, it's 0%, it's just a matter of giving as your heart moves to you. I, that's not my goal. That's not, I don't want to try and tell you that there's some kind of dogmatic formula that you have to follow this or you're out of the pleasure of God. It's not the way. In, the, in fact, when you get into the New Testament, which takes all of those Old Testament principles of tithing and offerings, the bigger emphasis is not the percentage that you're giving, but it's that you're giving generously. Generosity is the primary concept that is uh, emphasized in the New Testament. So if we're just giving begrudgingly of 10%, or even if you're giving begrudgingly of 23%, or even if you're uh, like some incredible uh, people I've read about, they do, they call it reverse tithe, and they give 90% of their income and live off of the 10%. Wow. That's amazing. But if they're giving 90%, like, ah, 90%, all right, here you go, God. That's, that's worthless. Because it's generosity that, that God is creating in us. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second here. But I also want to take a moment to explain this idea of faith commitments. Because especially if you're, if you're watching online, you've probably never even heard that term if you're not a part of our church. It's a, it's a term that we use at Living Way Church that helps us set our mission budget. Next Saturday night and Sunday, we're going to talk about the 18 missionaries that we support. We support them financially not necessarily through our tithes and offerings that we receive, but through our faith commitments. And our faith commitments is you saying, God, I want, I'm asking you to provide for me this amount that I can give primarily, exclusively designated towards missions. And we take that money that is pledged. We have a faith commitment, which for the first time ever, I'm really excited about this, this upcoming Saturday, it's all web-based. So you actually Enter your faith commitment pledge online. It's really cool. Set up on the, the, the lwcpoway.com. Uh, and you say, I'm going to give this amount to world missions. And by the, and, and by the way, you, you pledge that amount. We don't come and tell you, uh, you didn't do that amount. Like, it's just you saying, by faith, I want God to provide for me for $10 a month, $100 a month, $1,000 a month, whatever it is. And as he provides for me, then I'm going to give that money to the work of the kingdom. I'm going to give that money to the work of missions. And then we take that money, we look at our 18 missionaries, we divide it up, and we support them on a monthly basis according to the pledged amount in our faith commitment. So we've been doing that for as long as I've been a part of the church. So for 40-something years, that's how our mission budget is set. We're going to receive those next Saturday. Uh, you can actually start today. If you, if you go online and you say, I already know the amount, but I actually, I actually pray about it and ask, God, what do you want to provide in me so that I can give to missions? And then next Sunday, we'll see, we will tabulate and look and say, this is the amount that has been pledged to missions. And we're so thankful that God's going to provide in you to bless and to send out and to support missionaries around the world. Next Saturday night, we're going to hear from a bunch of those missionaries. I can't wait. I'm really, really excited. But that's what our faith commitments are. So if you're watching online, that's the explanation. If you're here presently, that's the explanation for our faith commitments. And now God uses all three things, tithes, offerings, missionary givings, however he works in your life to support the ministry. Sure, yes, but there's more than just supporting the ministry. I want to tell you three reasons God gives you, God commands you to give and how it helps transform you and how it helps combat temptation in your life. I told you, two essential ingredients to a feast is giving and enjoying. But there's something really, really good that happens when you give. A lot of good, but I'm just going to tell you three this morning. The first is this. God commands us to give because in order to give, we must work hard. You, you can't give if you don't have anything. And you won't have anything if you're not actually working. So God commands you to give because God wants you to work. He doesn't want you to work for your salvation. He wants you to work because you are a blessing to others when you work, when you contribute. You are blessed yourself when you work. Paul said it this way in, to, in, in Acts, Acts chapter 20. Now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, 
which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Jesus wants you to give. Absolutely. But he wants you to work hard so that you have the means to give. Let me tell you this. This, I saw the, the headlines this past week. Big, big, big Powerball lottery. I guarantee you that this is not how God wants you to give. God doesn't want you to go, Dear Jesus, if you give me the winning Powerball numbers, I promise to tithe. In fact, he doesn't even want you to reverse tithe. You could even promise, Jesus, this, uh, this, this lottery winnings is so big, I think I could live on just 10%, and I'll give 90% back to you. You could pray that with the most sincere prayer of faith. But that's not what God wants. Because if you do that, if you win the lottery in order that you give, if you say, God, if you provide for me, then I'm going to give to you, then he's like, uh, I think you're kind of missing this principle that giving requires you to actually work. I want you to work. I want you to be a contributor, not just of finances, but of actual betterment to the society, betterment to your neighbor, better, better uh, to your family. Everyone benefits when we're working. We're, we're designed for it. God, God created work before the fall. God set Adam and Eve in the garden and said, work it. It's not a curse. The curse is the, the poor way in which we work. The sweat and the, the bad attitude. That's, that's the curse. That's, but the work is not the curse. The work is a blessing. The work is a gift that is given to us by the good gift giver. So he wants you to work. And as you work and earn you give. By the way, we were talking about tithing. Like, uh, I, I didn't set it as a weekly principle or even a biweekly principle, even though for most of us, you probably get your income, you get your paycheck every other week, maybe, maybe once a month, whenever. But they would get a paycheck only when the harvest occurred. So it was always a tithe on the basis of that. So it wasn't a weekly type of thing. So there's no principle that says you have to give every week or you have to give whenever your paycheck comes in, but you have to give as you receive the, the, uh, the revenue, the, the, the benefits of your labor. So we give. Um, oh, there's a second reason why God commands us to give. This is, this is, this is too cool. This is such a God thing. <laughs> All right. God commands us to give so that we can receive a bountiful harvest. Now, true story, and I hope that he's watching online, even though I know he's not. So yesterday... I have a group of friends. They're all, we're all dads of uh, kids. Our kids are all go to the same elementary school. And so before the pandemic, we would all park in the same parking lot and walk our kids over, drop them off at school, and then we would walk back to the parking lot and we would all hang out and, and solve all the world's problems. These dads. Now, none of them are really believers. None of them are churchgoers. And that's why I say, like, I hope they're watching. That'd be cool. Hey, how's it going, guys? Um, but this happened yesterday. So we haven't met in, a, in you know, a year because of the pandemic. But it was one of the, the guys, their 55th birthday. So we, their, his wife set up a surprise party, meet in the parking lot. It's great. So we all got out and socially distanced and spaced and, and just having a great time talking. And one of the guys says to me, says, like, <laughs> it's just hilarious. He says, hey, I've been getting up at like 4.30 in the morning. And on the antenna, because he's a very frugal gentleman, he doesn't have cable TV, he doesn't re do internet TV, he has an antenna TV. That's why I know he's probably not watching. He said, on the antenna show, there's this, like, this, like, preacher guy. And this preacher guy, every, every week, he's always, like, sowing, sowing. It's all about sowing. You got to sow so you reap. You got to sow so you reap. And I was like, uh... Yeah, I'm going to preach that verse tomorrow, Jonathan. 
<laughs> it's, it's like, that's incredible. And he's like, oh, you're that TV preacher. So, yeah. So here it is, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 11. You've got to sow so that we reap. God wants us to give so that we receive a bountiful harvest. He wants us to sow so that we will reap. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. It's tr- See, Jonathan, it's right there. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. The TV preacher's not making it up. I'm not making it up. God said it. So what's he talking about? And this is not just for Jonathan. It's for all of us. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which will through us, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. What a great verse. What a great passage. This is good. And I'm not preaching this on the idea. This is to Jonathan's point. He's, he's like, that, that preacher, all he's doing is saying, sow a thousand and get back ten thousand. No, that's not. He's right. That guy is a, a, a huckster. I'm not telling you sow a thousand to get back ten thousand. God doesn't tell you sow a thousand to get back ten thousand. You don't, you don't give so that he will give back. That's not any different than the, the, the praying that you win the lottery. You give so that others participate in the feast. I told you, a feast doesn't exist unless somebody is supplying for it. The Thanksgiving meal doesn't just appear out of nowhere. There's somebody that's earning the money to buy the turkey. There's somebody that's cooking the turkey. There's somebody that's setting the table. There's somebody that's doing the dishes, and her name is Mom. We just know that. She does all of it. Right? We give so that everyone participates in the feast. So the more that we give, the more the harvest. Not that's, that's not more that comes back to you. That's more that get to embrace and, and celebrate and be a part. that temptation in our lives, that, that selfishness that's inside of our lives. Giving lifts up our eyes off of ourselves and puts it out there onto others. When we give each Sunday, when, you, when we, we mention giving, say, oh, go to lwcpoway.com slash give. When you go on there and you give, you are actively battling the temptation to think that all of your money is yours and it all belongs to you and you're going to stock it up, pile it all up. Instead, you're saying, I want others to know the glory of Jesus Christ. I want others to be a part of the feast. We want a big harvest, church. As I look ahead to the end of this pen, and I pray for, and I dream, this sanctuary filled with people, people in every single row, those those red rows that are blocked off are no longer blocked off. You're going to have people sitting next to you. Oh, no. You're going to have to, you're not even going to be wearing a mask. Oh, no. This place will be filled with people coming together to rejoice that Jesus Christ loves them and that he saved them. And it's possible because right now, you right now are giving. You're sowing so that we all rejoice in the harvest. We sow in tears and we're going to reap with shouts of joy. That's what's going, that's, the good stuff, the good stuff, it's on the store. All right, that's, that's two reasons why God wants you to give. Here's a third. God commands us to give because when we give, we're like him. We're like him. God is a giver. He is a generous giver. He gives and gives and gives and he gives. And he wants us, we're being transformed to be like Christ. Therefore, therefore, if we're going to be like Christ, we have to be generous just makes sense. 
Can you imagine if Jesus is like, uh, yeah, I'm willing to go to the cross, but only 10%, because I'm just going to tithe myself on the cross. What? He's 100% gives his life for us. He gives everything. And so when we give, in every act of giving, whether it be your tithes, your offerings, your faith commitments, whether it be a five do- no, a $10, $20 bill for your Starbucks. You, got, you just bought one little, how much is a mocha frappuccino? Five twenty-five. Oh my gosh. You bought a $5.25 drink and then you tipped $14.75 on top of it. Whoo! That is generous. That is a blessing. That's a bl- right? Baristas? Where are my baristas at? <laughs> oh, I love they're right there. So yeah. Every act of generosity is a reflection not of how much you have, but of Christ who has you, who has your heart. I want us to be so generous, church, because the more generous we are, the more like Christ we are. And so Paul writes to Timothy. Oh, this is a good word. As for the rich in this present age, in 1 Timothy 6, 17, charge them. Now, now that's the ESV is charge, but I think it's the NIV says command them. So if you're rich this morning, and by the way, in relative terms, every person that is here is rich in terms of this world. Here's the charge. Not to be haughty, not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good and to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Can you receive this word this morning, my rich fellow members of the kingdom? commanded, you are commanded, you're rich in this world, but God wants you to have treasures in heaven. God wants you to be rich like he is, to be generous, to do good works, to not be proud. And do you notice tucked in there to enjoy? Wait, what's that say? God commands the rich to Not set their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. It's not hard to read this, that God commands you to enjoy. He wants you to be generous, yes. But if you're generous and generous and generous and not enjoying, then you're out of step with the will of God. God calls us to enjoy. Martha was great in all of the work that she wanted to do to serve Jesus. But Mary was better because she didn't just want to serve Jesus. She wanted to love Jesus. She wanted to enjoy Jesus. Giving and enjoying both are essential to the feast. Again, I will emphasize this. If all you're doing is begrudgingly giving, you're missing out. And if all you're doing is enjoying without giving, feast on the presence of God by both giving and enjoying. Or, let's put it this way, be on the the feast of God. (laughs) Those stupid seas candies have got me in so much trouble this morning. I am really, really regretting my life right now. Oh, it's like all I can see are the eyes. That's all. I don't even see the face. It's just the eyes. And I'm not even looking and I feel them. It's incredible. He wants us to enjoy life. He wants us to enjoy our 
spouse, our children, our friends, our parents. God wants us to enjoy having neighbors. He wants us to enjoy our community. He wants us to enjoy all of the life that he gives us. He really does. And you're not going to enjoy the life he gives you if you're fooling around with sin. You're just not. You're going to be carrying shame and guilt and sorrow, pain, all these things if you're God. It doesn't work. Solomon, they, they, they suppose, was the writer of Ecclesiastes. And he had this very succinct idea about what life is all about. He says it in Ecclesiastes 5, 18 to 20. Behold, what I've seen to be good and fitting is to eat and to drink and to find enjoyment in all the toil, notice the work part, with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and to rejoice in his toil. This is the gift of God. For he will not remember, he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. God wants us to enjoy these gifts. He wants us to enjoy being generous. He wants us to enjoy being a part of the kingdom of God. So I'm just going to leave you two two final thoughts, two final verses about this idea of enjoying before we have our worship team come back up and conclude our service this morning. When I keep saying enjoy and it's a a matter of a feast, I I, I really think this is kind of cool to think about. This feast that we are called to be participants in is a feast that is accompanied by angels. Angels. This isn't just you. This isn't just the corner of Twin Peaks and Midland Road on Poway, in Poway. This isn't just America. This isn't just North America. This isn't just 21st century. This isn't just the saints who have gone before us. It's even the angels that enjoy the presence of God, the eternal feast. Hebrews 12, 22, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering. We, are, we get to enjoy God with the angels. Look ahead. Look to this glory. Look to this promise. And don't settle for the trivial nonsense temptations of this world. Look ahead. And then we're also, and this is so important, when we talk about enjoying, because there's these, the, 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 the lies of Satan are these hedonistic pleasures that are temporary to the body, maybe to the mind, but have long-lasting damaging effects on our soul. So don't fall victim to those lies. Again, I told you at the beginning, Satan will lie about temptation. So always keep in mind that we are to enjoy righteousness righteousness. Psalm 89, 15 and 16. Blessed are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your face, who exult in your name all the day, and in your righteousness are exalted. The barometer, the measurement of whether or not this thing that you are enjoying should be enjoyed has to come down to ultimately, is it within the righteousness of God? It said about Moses in Hebrews 11 that he chose suffering rather than enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. So ultimately, if you, I don't want you to go off base on this idea of enjoying and, and, and twist it around. Say, well, God wants me to enjoy and I really enjoy this sinful activity. Don't fall, don't fall for that. No, if you enjoy a sinful activity, that's a demonstration of the unrighteousness that is inside your heart. Behold Jesus. Ask him to work that out and to change your affections because there are so many good gifts that God has given to you to enjoy and to help you to resist the temptations. So behold Jesus, church. Praise Jesus. We just sang a new song. We learned a new song this morning. I'll have the worship team come back up and we're going to Sing it as our conclusion. 
we praise you, we praise you. And it says uh, in the bridge there, this is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. That's a feast. Feasting in the presence of God, feasting on his presence, enjoying him. That's what we are called to do. So we're not settling for the temporary and fleeting pleasures of this world. So would you stand with me as I pray over you and we conclude our service by singing, we praise you. Jesus, right now, I pray for everyone who is enduring temptation, that we would fix our eyes on you who overcame all temptation and who paid for our sin with your blood. Lord, would we look to the celebration that is in store for us in you, the wedding supper of the Lamb that we are invited to eternally feast with you, And Lord, with every little feast that we experience today, every quiet pleasure of enjoying our our children playing, of laughter with our friends, of a beautiful song, Lord, let every little pleasure that is holy and righteous remind us that you are so much better. We want to behold you. And as we behold you, be transformed. Jesus, work by the power of your Spirit in each of our hearts to see you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I know it's a new song. We're just learning it this morning, but let's sing it again. We praise you. This is what heaven says.
awesome. Praise Him. Praise Him. Resist temptation. Combat temptation. Fight against those false teachings and the threats of the enemy. Be transformed by beholding Jesus. He's so good, so true, so beautiful. I look forward to seeing you next, this Saturday night at 6 o'clock. Be a part of our mission weekend. Hear the good, glorious things that God's doing in our missionaries' lives. Saturday night at 6.